the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster by the Red Challengers. On January 28, 1986, only 73 seconds into its flight, the NASA Space Shuttle Challenger collapsed just off the coast of Cape Canaveral in Florida, killing all seven crew members. Of the four spacecrafts in NASA's fleet, Challenger was in fact the most reliable. It had flown 40% of all shuttle missions and sent 51 astronauts to space on nine trouble-free flights. Bad weather had delayed the launch for over a week, and on the last day, NASA sent a weather balloon and the data seemed to be fine. However, unseasonably cold weather had covered the padding sheets with ice and icicles over one meter long. No shuttle had ever launched in such freezing conditions. However, a decision was made and mission was a go. Now what happened? Well, there was a malfunction in the right solid rocket booster. O-rings in the lowermost field joint lost elasticity due to the freezing cold temperatures. The O-rings did not enlarge as they should have to prevent leakage. Now who was responsible for this? Marshall and Thiokol were the contractors responsible for the construction and maintenance of NASA's Challenger spacecraft. And of course, the Marshall Space Flight Center was responsible for the overall mission. On the night before the launch, Thiokol engineers state that they did not test the O-rings in temperatures under 12 degrees Celsius. And on the morning of the launch, it was a staggering negative one degree Celsius. Three individuals pushed to postpone the flight until temperatures rose. However, NASA declined due to a number of delays that had already set the launch back. Now we're gonna look at the ethical issues in this case. There are several ethical issues involved in this case. Under the Professional Misconduct Act, section 72.2A, B, C, and D. Under the Code of Ethics, section 77.1.3, 77.1.5, and 77.2.1. There are four alternative paths to this case. The first is to essentially do nothing, which is what happened in real life. It results in fatalities and solves no ethical issues. The second is to go public, which eliminates secrecy by releasing the information to the public, and this ensures accountability for the parties involved. However, this still violates the Code of Ethics under Section 77.1.1 and 77.7.1 with respect to fairness to employer and fellow practitioners. The third is to inform the astronauts. This would resolve the ethical dilemmas of the previous path as it would not release information to the public. However, it does not guarantee that anything will be done to preserve their lives. It does nothing to answer the breaches in section 72. The fourth is to whistleblow, and in our case, it would be to inform the PEO. The information would be relayed to authorities who have the power to influence the situation. It would ensure that the engineers have done all they can to preserve the life and well-being of the astronauts. However, it does still technically breach the code of ethics under section 77.1.1 and 77.7.1. Ultimately, a decision was made to be the whistleblower and inform the PEO, because this prioritizes human life over all else. It does not violate the Professional Engineers Act Section 72 under professional misconduct and has the greatest chance out of all paths to save the astronauts' lives. Now we're gonna look at the legalities associated with this case. This case deals with tort law. In order to test for tort law, the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty of care, the defendant must have breached that duty by his or her misconduct, and the defendant's conduct caused an injury to the plaintiff. The relevant precedent cases involved in our case are Wolverine II versus Noranda and Arthur Little, and Donahue versus Stevenson. There is one plaintiff in this case, the families of the astronauts, and several defendants, and it indeed does pass for tort law. The defendant would be regarded as concurrent tortfeasors, NASA managers, dial call managers, and engineers will be held responsible for the aftermath. They would be liable for all the consequences, monetary and emotional, resulting from the disaster. Ultimately, a court would find the defendants guilty on the count of negligence as per the precedent cases. Defendants would be responsible for general damages, consequential damages, punitive damages, and aggravated damages.